The dust is still settling after the open beater for the finals has ended. Two closed beaters and one open beater done and the finals has now exploded like a grenade in a microwave that's in a kitchen where the gas oven has been left on overnight. That's to say Embark Studios have been baking this juicy and delicious, insanely fun and competitive destruction mad shooter for a while now and it's almost instantaneously leapt as high as fourth place on Steam charts with Embark reporting a colossal 7.5 million players in total across all platforms jumping into the game. The free-to-play, fast-paced and team-based arena shooter with a game show lore and already crazy range of cosmetics has been crafted for its uniqueness by the Stockholm-based developer, a studio with around 300 staff that is laced so heavily with X-Dice developers that you can literally smell Battlefield 1's sweet perfume on the game's clothes. G'day Rocky and here! Let's review The Finals, a game whose development I've followed closely since it was first mentioned by Embark Studios back in November 2020. The Finals has just completed its open beta with a planned launch coming before year's end, so any review right now comes with one main caveat. Expect plenty of polishing to be happening by the devs in the interim, and there were plenty of bugs during the playtest, some minor like getting stuck on the edge of a map, and some major that meant players had multiple crashes. It goes without saying that those all need working on. Now I won't be spending much time discussing the bugs in this review, let's just take it as a given that they all need work. What other info should you know about this review? Well, I've played a little over 100 hours of the game now and I feel like I know it pretty well and that's despite me being based in New Zealand where my ping to a US server hovers around 150 or more, so I've had an almost worst case scenario experience for the game that has movement run on its server. Also I have no idea what the game has been like for those on console or controller. I'm a PC mouse and keyboard guy. Anyhow, let's dive into the review, starting with game modes. The game currently has four modes plus a practice range, although realistically the four modes are actually only two modes, with one of them having three variations. Quick cash, unranked tournaments and ranked tournaments are all based on the same mode, where in a team of three you find a vault, take it to a cash out and defend it until it finishes cashing out. Quick cash is the casual version with only three teams, faster respawn timers, faster extraction times and only one vault at a time. The four team unranked and ranked tournaments only differ by the number of rounds with unranked having three and ranked four. The remaining mode, Bank It, is casual friendly and sees four teams of three battle it out for coins with a greater focus on combat. Given their popularity, the quick cash style modes will almost certainly remain the core mode for the finals and will probably see various other modes added as alternatives, some of which might come and go on a seasonal basis. There's currently this bizarre duality within the community with some players saying that they predict that the quick cash style modes will become boring because of their simplicity, but then many, including well-known content creators, commenting that they are massively addicted to playing round after round of the game. The way I see it is that the finals has managed to tap into that competitive guttural instinct to compete over and over for the elusive win while accepting that they might not come that often. Just because the quick cash style modes have pretty simple rules doesn't mean that they will get boring. In the same way that football or tennis or golf at their heart have very simple rules but don't get boring for the participants because it's the players who drive the novelty of each match. Further, I think the ranked tournament has the potential to go down the eSport path purely from its competitiveness, with each round having unexpected outcomes as teams search for that new way of stealing a cash out or defending one. There will be challenges that lie ahead for the game as a possible eSport though and I'll come back to those later in the video, but I think the sheer competitiveness and varied outcomes around each objective place the game's main mode in a group of some of the best that FPS gaming has seen. Having said that, I also think it's undeniable that there will be an enormous casual audience for this game that Embark must cater for, because overall they will probably make up the bulk of the players and therefore the lead source of income for the developer through the inevitable microtransactions that the free-to-play game requires. Bank it and the more casual friendly quick cash are unlikely to be enough casual modes to keep casual players completely entertained. At release, the game will need a wider variety of options to choose from when it comes to casual modes where you can just have 
have fun and experiment with new ways of playing the game. I'd like to see Embark try to push the boundaries with modes. For instance, I talked about a mode I called Target in the video linked above, which is kind of like King of the Hill, but the hill moves. Additionally, maybe have a quick cash round that runs in a longer format, like for 30 minutes, or dare I say it, even have a Battle Royale mode. I really want to see Embark experiment a lot here. Please also let the record show that I have not suggested a 32v32 mode where you try to capture points around the map for your team. Whatever additional modes we see when the game releases or shortly after, Embark has already excelled with the current modes. The quick cash style modes are a refreshing experience in the shooter genre and the sheer number of players enjoying the open beta is a testament to that. Lastly, on the mode front, I would like to see the practice range modified to allow a team to practice there together. It is a team game after all. Along those lines, I think it would be better if the practice range was larger with two or three buildings next to each other so you can practice rooftop combat and moving from building to building. I reckon you should also be able to access all weapons in the practice range so you can properly assess whether you want to unlock a weapon or not before taking it into the arena. Now let's talk about balance. In any game where there are varying character builds and a fairly wide choice of abilities, primary weapons and gadgets to choose from, balance is not going to happen immediately and with quite a lot of bugs to deal with during the playtest, some of them game breaking, I suspect the devs probably didn't have too much time to work on balancing. However, some progress has been made since the previous closed beaters. A lot of the primary weapons, melee weapons and throwables felt reasonably balanced and I saw most weapons being used through the playtest and a wide range of the gadgets, which is always a good sign. However, there are certainly some noticeable outliers. The light stun gun is probably the most unbalanced item in the game. With its ability to remove about 90% of an opponent its movement as well as continuing to operate after the player switches from it to their primary weapon, it provides a hugely frustrating lack of opportunity for defense by anyone hit by it. What makes it even more OP is that it's operated on a build that can use the cloaking ability to get close with little chance of detection prior to it being used and has a currently OP primary weapon in the V9S pistol to follow it up. You simply can't have a weapon like the stun gun that removes 90% of player agency from an opponent without a huge amount of frustration coming from players. A couple of options would be either to have the stun gun's dose of electricity shortened so that the victim can begin to move at the same time as the attacking light player is switching to their primary, promoting a more even fight, or have it operate as is but make it a low damage primary weapon so that if it's used in tandem with another teammate being alongside you, you can stun an opponent while your teammate does the bulk of the damage to take them out without competition, with the compromise being that it requires two of your team to provide this overpowering move. Either way, the stun gun definitely needs addressing. Additional balance changes I would like to see are allowing any grenade to set fire to gas, because right now there's a meta for always gassing cash outs, and without a pyro grenade or flamethrower you're in trouble because the gas is pretty nasty, and essentially prevents a cash out steal. Plus if you use a pyro grenade to ignite the gas around the cash out, you're essentially blocking yourself from being able to steal with the pyro. I think the flamethrower should have a longer and narrower range of spray so if it's targeted accurately then it's strong but opponents also have the chance to evade it more easily by moving to one side or the other. It would also look cooler with a long flame coming out of it I reckon. As I mentioned before the V9S needs a little nerf and I'd like to see the devs experiment with some variations with the shields. For instance perhaps having the bottom of the dome shield just slightly off the ground so a perfectly placed grenade could be thrown beneath its lower edge, as this would vary up the gunfights a bit and not just see an entire team effectively all hovering behind a shield. Overall though, none of these imbalances feel like they can't be overcome. The whole strengths and weaknesses thing of the three different builds and their loadouts works really well, makes for entertaining but challenging play, and is something the devs will just need to keep fine tuning heading into the game's release. So balance for the game overall is kind of middling at the moment, but has the potential 
potential to be great. Balancing aside, the finals provides a pretty sweet choice of weaponry no matter which build you favour, with 20 weapons, 26 gadgets and 9 abilities to currently choose from across the board. It's a really solid place for the game to start from and any expansion on this armoury will be a bonus in my opinion. Also the variety allows most players to play the way they want. For instance you can take a heavy build who is totally built for bashing buildings to bits or is loaded up with a decent gun and RPG and grenades and a defensive shield for being in the thick of the gunplay. I would like to see the option to easily swap out gun sights added. I'm sure this would be popular with a lot of FPS players and I'd actually like to see an option tree added for each weapon similar to that seen in Battlefield 5. I think this would be a great way to be able to tailor your loadout even further to match your individual playstyle. Like the heavies RPG to have the option to take it down one of two paths. Either having the propelled grenade work as a building buster that does little damage to players or yourself if you use it close by but does massive damage to structures or have it as a player focused weapon that maybe includes a pyro and frag combo grenade so it damages players on impact as well as leaving fire behind for any latecomers but does only modest damage to the buildings. Use it near yourself though and you'd be toast. A weapon upgrade or variation tree like this would provide a lot more individuality in the game and each build would feel less like it's an off the shelf kind of setup even with the choice of abilities, weapons and gadgets. Alternatively Embark could just provide us that wide range of weapon variations. I think either could work well. Gunplay in the game is pretty good. I'm not raving about it because there are a few things that need addressing. For instance it's kind of weird that your bullets don't always go where the gun is pointing. They just always go to where the crosshair is even if the gun is pointing elsewhere. I think that needs refining. I've also seen a few people commenting about the TTK being too long but I think it's actually fine and fits well with the style of the game. This isn't Battlefield after all despite what I said at the beginning of the video. This is one area that because of my high ping is a bit harder for me to judge. I found myself returning to the heavy build with the flamethrower time and again because I knew I was less likely to have aiming issues because of the distance to the server. There's a few bugs with the weapons that need addressing such as weapons not firing after reload sometimes and grenade throw animations failing to work. Overall I'd say that gunplay and weapons are currently a solid pass with some room for improvement. Embark Studios has absolutely hit it out of the park with the server side destruction in the finals. This extraordinary game feature is a hallmark of the game's uniqueness, adding so much to every enemy encounter because you never quite know what will happen to the structure you're fighting in. Bring the building down to you, break your way down through the building, drop your enemy out of sight by hitting the roof under them, break the zip lines as they're using them. <laughs> bring entire buildings down if you have the time and the inclination. The variety and scale of destruction is an endless source of enjoyment in the finals and a massive ace played by the devs. It is the best destruction in any FPS game by a long long way and has set a massive benchmark for other studios to look up to. How many more titles will Embark make that feature this kind of destruction before any other studio even comes close to what they have done? Imagine what genres they could take on by adding this kind of destruction. It is utterly sublime. For the server side destruction to work you have to have server side movement as well. I'm not sure how many players realise that these two things are inextricably tied together. I mentioned this in a previous video but I watched Shroud playing the other day and he commented probably without understanding what he was actually saying that having movement on the server was a terrible decision by Embark because he felt that the movement in the game was a little laggy. Now I'm really not singling Shroud's comment out for any reason other than to make the point that if the finals has an Achilles heel it may be having to have the movement on the server but it is a requirement that will always be there. Movement has to be server side so that players move with the chunks of building that are falling beneath their feet. Change that and the suspension of disbelief ends and players will start clipping through floors and it all starts to become a mess. Embark have said in their Meet the Makers podcast previously that they have some ways of tricking us to make the movement as smooth as possible but in the end no one can beat the laws of physics 
physics and reduce your ping to the server down to nothing unless you're in the same building as the server. There will always be some lag between your input and what the server shows you and it's something we're probably just going to have to accept. And that slight lagginess could potentially add up to be too much slot to allow the finals to be an eSport. I can't see players or the audience accepting that a hundred grand cash is on the line and then have any preciseness from the server get in the way of the players competing. The same could be said for the randomness of the destruction. You can't have a player briefly getting caught on an object that they shouldn't have when the livelihood of a professional eSporter is held in the balance. However, I'd far rather have the movement and destruction the way it is than lose the destruction altogether for the sake of eSport. It's going to be interesting to see how precise Embark can make this game. The three maps we have are a load of fun and moving around them always feels like you can follow your instinct to find your way across the map. Run in the general direction you need to go and you'll almost always clearly see how to get there, except the odd time that you fall off buildings or smash through a wall to discover it's an external wall that's 30 floors up. I like the differences between Monaco and Seoul and I think the Skyway Stadium is a great way to combine the two of those maps but still make the map feel unique. Three maps won't be enough for launch though, I feel like they could get away with five maps and definitely five unique maps plus blends of those would be plenty. It's not a game that is defined by its maps in the way that Battlefield is but we still need some variety. I hope whatever maps they add next offer something a bit different like the tight alleyways of Bangkok's Chinatown or central London or a forest full of treetop walkways. Something a bit different will do the trick. Embark has done a fantastic job of the way the game looks. The game looks fresh and vibrant and the maps are exquisitely lit be it day or night matches. The environmental artists have excelled in having enough detail around the maps that make it very much feel like the real world, but not so much that it gets in the way of the gameplay. For instance, the wooden pallets and building materials lying around the construction sites make it feel fleshed out, but without making it cluttered. The little details and things like the concrete walls, flower pots and roof tiles just look super realistic as well. It's a wonderful attention to detail. Moving on to audio, the music in the game is brilliant. The synth and drum machine laden soundtrack is just so perfect for the game. For a lot of games I turn the music off completely but not for the finals. The in game audio is mostly great especially the effects like the coin sounds and things like the whir of zip lines which adds so much texture to the game. The gun sounds for the game aren't precise in the way that Escape from Tarkov sounds are but they really don't need to be either. This is an arena style shooter after all. One area that I do think could use a little extra work is enemy footsteps. They just don't seem to cut through the surrounding noise quite enough, especially when there's a lot going on. I reckon bumping those up in the mix a bit would allow us to catch those sneaky cloaking lights moving up behind us a lot more. Overall though, I think the audio is super solid. Embark should be hugely proud of the performance improvements they've made in the game. I've seen multiple people in the Discord mentioning that they're getting over 200 FPS, and with an i9 CPU and 3080 Ti GPU, I found the game to almost always run buttery smooth. Only once or twice did I notice the server having little moments where things slowed down for a second or two, but overall the devs have made massive gains on the performance front. Okay, let's talk about the UI. Firstly, the in-game UI is simple and clean, but provides all the info you need. The kill notifications could take up a little less screen space, I suppose, but otherwise it's a great UI. Similarly, the out-of-game UI is easy to navigate, and I especially like the process of editing your contestant and their loadout. It's all user-friendly and really obvious what you're doing. Likewise, the store is easy to move through, although we'll probably need to wait until the game has been launched and is actual transactions to be made here before judging it properly. The settings menu still seems to be a bit of a work in progress for the Embark team as there have been bugs throughout the playtest with key bindings which have been really frustrating. Slots wouldn't clear and key bindings would seemingly reset after a round. I also experienced that I couldn't set the thumb buttons on my mouse for some reason although I noticed some videos where other people could so maybe it's an issue that is more mouse specific but nonetheless I think a wide range of mouse button binding should be the standard. While the key binding issues was a pain, I'd expect these sorts of issues to be resolved by the time the game launches. Well, to be fair, they kind of need to be. I would like to see more choice around the cross here as well, such as being able to change line thickness and position and independently change the center dot. 
With the finals being a free-to-play game, Embark Studios are going to need to fight hard against cheating. Cheaters have already made their way into the game during the open beta and we even saw at least one round that we played in with a player shooting my teammate while they were facing away from them. With movement server side, I'm guessing that Embark may be able to detect any movement cheats more easily. I really hope anti-cheat becomes a strength for Embark because nothing spoils a great round faster than a cheater and we all know how free-to-play games seem to draw them in. As far as a review goes, I'd say it's too early to judge where the game is at with this overall, other than to acknowledge that it's already not immune to cheaters. Okay, so when we consider all of these things overall, the game is fresh, innovative, addictive and competitive. It also looks fantastic and has the best destruction a shooter has ever seen by a long, long way. There's still room for improvement around areas like movement, weapon balance and in-game audio. And we also need to see what maps and modes devs provide us at launch. But I think Embark Studios should be hugely proud of what they have achieved so far. And I hope they keep polishing this game because the finals is shaping up to be an absolutely seminal masterpiece. Lastly, I'll leave you with this thought. This is Embark Studios' first game. Imagine what they will bring to us after this. Thanks for watching this video to the end. Do the usual YouTube business if you want to see more about the game from me from now on and give a like or comment as you see fit. Enjoy the rest of your day. Kia kaha. Stay strong. Everybody knows the world ain't right down on your knees, get up and fight.